Who knows? Maybe I'm recording this. Try. Okay. Um, for intro to counseling, I've neglected doing a little bit more lecturing, which I intend to do. So today I'm going to get started a bit on that. I'd like to go back and add some things to what, uh, to the very um, interesting and fairly, fairly good presentation that we saw on cross-cultural counseling. So I'm going to switch to some PowerPoint here and let's see if I can figure out how to do that. There we go. Let's share that. All right, so um, I'm going to zip through this first few slides fairly quickly because the, the team who presented did a pretty good job of covering most of this stuff. So they covered Capuzzi and Gross's cross-cultural counseling model, sort of their incorporation of things. Um, and they talked about how, and, and so I'm going to review here, how cross-cultural counseling has to be something that becomes integrated into the way you do all therapy. Cross-cultural counseling perspective, which I'm very much on board with. I mean, there's, there are people who call themselves cross-cultural counselors, cross-cultural therapists. Uh, my opinion is that everybody needs to be a cross-cultural therapist. I am very much on board with a lot of this stuff. Um, Cross-cultural counseling is how we in, is incorporating into therapy all of these different client characteristics and therapist and sorry and therapist and counselor characteristics as well. So there's all this stuff that we incorporate. I'm going to talk about a little bit of this as we go along. The team who presented already mentioned a lot of this. So CNG, Capuzzi and Gross, your textbook, their conceptual framework, they have various dimensions. And so looking quickly, their very first area of focus in their foundational dimension, which is their most important dimension, is self-awareness. It's not awareness of other cultures, it's awareness of yourself. Um, and then after that, they talk about global literacy, and you need to especially be literate about the culture, the history, the patterns, the customs of the people that you're working with, of the cultures that they came from. And that's a lifelong process. I mean, there are thousands upon thousands of cultures. And so whoever you're working with, it's going to be a struggle and a challenge to get to know the culture. The easiest way is to live in the culture, live with people from the culture, but that's not practical for many counseling situations. You can't say I'm going to do six weeks of counseling with somebody who's a Hmong refugee from Vietnam or Laos or something. And uh, wait, do the Hmong come from Laos? I'm not sure. <coughs> and then say, okay, before I do counseling, I need to go, you know, live in the Hmong community for a year. I mean, it, it just doesn't it doesn't always work out that way. So, uh, on, on top of that, you need to have knowledge of traditional counseling theory. So you need to know how to counsel, how to do counseling and therapy in the first place. And you need ethics. They also have, and then that's foundational. And the cross cultural dimensioning is theoretical knowledge, like how, in, in theory, uh, theoretically speaking, how does cross cultural counseling work? And then you need to have cross-cultural encounters. And so this is a concept that comes from critical theory, from cultural theory, embraced very much by cross-cultural theory, the idea of a cultural encounter, a cross-cultural encounter. And that's an interaction, an interpersonal interaction between two people from different cultures, which is almost everybody almost all the time, but sometimes it's a really big cultural difference. So you need to understand then the cultural characteristics of counseling, because counseling always has cultural characteristics, and you can choose to add others or focus on others, depending on who you're working with or how you approach things. Cross-cultural counseling is explicitly sociopolitical in nature. I would say all counseling is sociopolitical in nature. I've tried to impress that on you, I mean, in our half semester of in-person face-to-face uh, lectures. Everything we do has a sociopolitical dimension. It, it's always... Uh, touching on issues or deeply embedded sometimes in issues of economics, class, race, ethnicity, and the history of how groups treat each other and the reality and the current reality of how groups treat each other. Counseling always fits into that, hopefully for the better, but historically not always for the better. Sometimes we have not been the good guys. So it's very important to be aware of how all this stuff is working. We need to understand issues of power and privilege. This is not a recent thing. It's only in the past few years that people, you know, college students started to say, check your privilege, man. Um, but this concept has been around for quite a long time, hundreds or maybe thousands of years. But in the United States and Europe, in recent decades, it's become a very important issue, uh, especially relating to the civil rights movement, to feminism, women's liberation, things like this. But the issue has been around for a long time. 
uh, Kapuzian grows in this second dimension, this cross-cultural dimension. They finally say, now work on your cross-cultural counseling skills. Wow, I did these kind of things, huh? So Kapuzian and Gross talk about three or six basic principles of cross-cultural counseling. Number one, and they, and they suggest that you need to accept these things if you're going to be a good cross-cultural counselor. Now, I, I don't know how deeply they are cross-cultural counselors. I think what they're doing is they're, they're listening very closely to people who are cross-cultural counselors who help them write this chapter, and they are um, kind of summarizing what's out there in cross-cultural counseling um, theory and practice. First of all, a culture, and I, I mentioned this very briefly, so I'm not going to go into this too much. A culture is a lot of things. It's identification or affiliation. Those are not the same thing based on any of the following common purpose, a common need, similarity of background. Those, that covers so much stuff. Um, so my wife had an anthropology class, and if I recall correctly, she said that her teacher, who was a grad student and might not have been putting his all into the class. Uh, he was doing his thesis or dissertation or something, studying a culture of indie musical bands in downtown Toronto, Ontario. Yeah, sure, it's a culture. <coughs> Almost anything is a culture in, well, when you look at it from this point of view. So look at all those different things. It covers thousands and thousands and thousands of different possibilities. Ah, Vikings like mineral water. You need to accept, if you're going to do this, that cultural differences are real and that they influence people. And Capuzzi and Gross go so far, well, they're quoting other people, they're going so far as to say they influence all human interactions. And I agree with this. I think they're correct. I think cultural differences do influence all human interactions. And there's a famous um, way of thinking lately uh, that says if you don't see a cultural dimension in, in things, it's probably because you're from the dominant culture. You don't have to see a cultural dimension. But believe me, the people who are less dominant, who have less social power, less money, a historical, um, a, a historical position of repression relative to your group, those people are aware of the cultural dimensions. If you're not aware of them, it probably just means that you have the privilege of not being aware of them because they all work in your favor. All counseling, therefore, is cross-cultural. Everybody comes from a slightly different culture. And when you're working with a client, a lot of what you're trying to do, especially early on, but all through the process, is understand their culture. They might be your next door neighbor, but you know this, right? You've got your next door neighbor, but then if the more you get to know them, the more you realize that they're kind of weird. They do things like they don't eat white bread. They take off their shoes when they go in the house. You know, there, there are different cultures and everybody is part of some little subset. Definitely every family and possibly every individual, if you really want to think about it, is part of some cultural subgroup, subculture of their own. Now, that doesn't mean every, every culture is as different from every other culture as, say, like, I don't know, working with the Yanomamo in the Amazon River Basin are from people living in Manhattan. I mean, there are much bigger differences and much smaller differences, but if you really want to start splitting all the hairs, you can find cultures everywhere. So all counseling is cross-cultural. All counseling is a process of trying to understand where somebody is coming from, how their behaviors and thoughts and attitudes and their psychological problems, if that's what they're coming to you for how those came from and fit within their culture, which will sometimes have some things in, in common with your culture, but sometimes have some things not. So number four for Kapuzi and Gross is to emphasize human diversity in all its many forms. There are a lot of forms of diversity, and a lot of the political battles we have are fighting over which of those should count. So sexual and gender identity, I think as a culture, we've basically decided those are okay. And the people who don't like the idea of those are okay are still pretty upset about it. But I think overall, we've decided that we need to pay attention to like sexual orientation, gender identity, things like this, that these are valid dimensions of diversity. But there are a lot of other ones. So when are we gonna to start to get really serious about accepting the diversity in people's body size and weight? And beyond that, let's say attractiveness. Attractiveness affects people's lives just as much as, say, race or ethnicity. And that might sound like a controversial statement, but there's a lot of research showing that um, you, you do get a different experience. And that's not in exactly the same ways, but the size of the differences is as big as any other dimension. Um, there are other dimensions. Should we pay attention? Should we 
have a special category where we need to make sure we respect people who are in law enforcement or military? Do we need to make sure that we consider the diversity of people who are attracted to children, for instance, pedophiles? I mean, there's a lot of questions about this. Oh, I'm going to pause this now because Matt Sodaro just showed up. All right. Hey, Matt. I'm Since nobody was here, I was recording a lecture, but you're here. So let me pause recording this lecture. All right, so where were we before we were so rudely interrupted by students showing up for office hours? Actually, it was a nice conversation we had. Uh, I was talking a little bit about Capuzzi and Gross's, uh, let me see here, Capuzzi and Gross's um, six basic principles. We made it about halfway through. Um, I was talking about an emphasis on diversity in all its many forms. There are a lot of different dimensions of diversity, and this is something in common between uh, feminist psychotherapy and cross-cultural psychotherapy. There's an emphasis in both cases on on equality in on all dimensions that matter. But the, the ma that matter that's interesting and that's an ongoing discussion. There's, there are a lot of different dimensions of diversity, and not everybody agrees on which dimensions should be um, celebrated, tolerated, uh, should be subjects of justice, and things like this. In general, though, there's an appreciation that we should err on the side of justice, on the side of reducing oppression, on the side of recognizing diversity. But like I said, not everybody agrees, and that's the dialectic, man. That's that's uh, uh, it's intersectionality. So um, principle number five that Capuzzi and Gross are talking about is that you need certain things to happen or to be in place before you can effectively intervene with people from culturally different backgrounds. By the way, if you hear that squawking sound, I don't know if you can hear it, it's a cat bird. They sound like cats dying. You need awareness, you need overall awareness that there are cultural differences, uh, awarenesses of what, of what the differences are or might be. <coughs> you need knowledge, you need knowledge of other people's backgrounds, other people's culture, other people's um, environment, etc. But you also need knowledge of counseling and how to do those things. Um, you need the skills to do counseling, and then some of those skills will need to be specific. And then finally, the last principle is you need overall global literacy. You need to just understand where your culture fits in a larger world. And, and this is where I can't be politically neutral all the time. Okay, you know I'm not politically neutral like ever. But this is one of the reasons. Um, global literacy means you need to understand that there are other cultures. And once you start studying other cultures, there's basically no justification that makes any sense for saying our culture is better because I'm from there or because we have a bigger military or because we have more money. I mean, the British Empire has gone through this, the Dutch Empire, the Spanish Empire, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, I mean, you know, the Romans, the Greeks, we're just another empire, man. And we're just another culture. The culture that we come from has its pluses, has its minuses, and the judgment of the pluses and minuses is not obvious. The judgment of what's good about a culture or bad about a culture comes from within a culture. And is suspect because of that. I mean, there's, there's no golden standard. There's no culture that's not really a culture. There's no standard, obvious culture. So nationalism makes no sense to me, partly because of these kinds of considerations. Um, patriotism, maybe, but nationalism, no. The idea that uh, our nation is better than other nations because I'm from here, or that America is exceptional because it's America. If we do things that make us exceptional, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm cheering, but... We're not exceptional just because we're Americans. We're a culture. We're one of the many cultures in the world. Well, we're thousands of the many cultures in the world. We're a meta-culture. And so global literacy Im implies putting yourself in the world, recognizing that you're part of it, that you're not the world, you're not the judge of the world because you come from a certain place. You have to judge. Everybody has to judge, but you're no more necessarily qualified to do that than somebody else. Everybody has to think. Everybody has to analyze. Everybody has to be critical and careful. Can't just give up your morals because you say, oh, there's lots of cultures. All, anything that happens in a culture must be okay. I mean, I don't think so. I don't, that's my opinion. I don't think you can descend into cultural relativism and call it good. Although I had a student last semester who made an excellent argument that you should. So, but I mean, I still didn't believe with her. Or I still didn't agree with her, but it was a very good argument, and she made me think pretty hard about that. So, sometimes you see um, 
you know, how to become culturally competent. People don't usually say it like this. Um, you'll go to trainings where they're kind of trying to teach you how, how to be culturally competent, and they focus on the skills to work with a particular group. But um, my suggestion, and Kabuzi and Gross, and most of the people I've ever read, their suggestion is that's not how it works. If you remember on the steps, that comes later. That comes far later. Rather, you start with yourself. You maximize your own awareness level. You need to be aware of who you are. You need to understand yourself. You need to know as much about yourself and about the culture that you're working with and the individuals you're working with as you can, as well as general counseling skills, specific counseling skills, and then finally, like cross, cross-cultural specific counseling skills with that particular uh, cultural group, etc. You need to expand, sorry, you need to expand your actual set of skills. You need practice, you need supervision and training by people who know what they're doing. And this is a huge part of being a counselor. Choose your supervisors carefully if you possibly can. Sometimes you don't have a choice. (coughs) But if you have a choice, exercise it intelligently. So we mentioned earlier this concept of a cross-cultural counseling encounter. An encounter is when people from different cultures have an interaction with each other it can be many different kinds of interaction like some people would say that it's a cross-cultural encounter if you watch someone on tv who's from a different culture than yourself and it's more or less a one-way encounter there but uh, still maybe it's an encounter we're really interested in the two-way encounters you talk to somebody you ride an elevator with somebody you're on a bus for a few hours with somebody you're in a class with somebody you're married to somebody you know you meet somebody on the street and you chat for a minute you have a fight with somebody any kind of interaction is a cross-cultural encounter and we're not going to be aware all the time of when these encounters occur if we're not aware of all the dimensions of diversity now I mentioned earlier that we sort of canonize some dimensions of diversity race ethnicity socioeconomic status um, and increasingly which is a good thing uh, gender and sex related variables so sexual attraction sexual preferences gender identity uh, gender expression things like this but other dimensions were much slower on and I mentioned some of those so If I were in class, I would pause and have people think about other kinds of dimensions. What other dimensions of diversity are there? And there are a lot, actually. And this is this is that term intersectionality that you hear in cross-cultural and feminist fields a lot. It's the idea of how of this constant dialectic, this discussion, this ongoing balancing effort as you discuss and try and figure out how to navigate uh, justice and the greatest good for the greatest number and not overlooking people just because they're minorities, etc., while taking into account all these different dimensions of diversity. So, anyway, there are a lot, and eventually this slide will, will change. Okay, a cross-cultural encounter, I think I've described it pretty well, can result, according to some standard cross-cultural theories, it can result in one of two kinds of outcomes. Multicultural incompetence, so it's interesting, it, it means the encounter went badly, but a specific type of badly. More or less, people came away from that um, without, well, they missed the opportunity to break down stereotypes. They missed down the, the opportunity to learn interesting and individualized information about each other and each other's cultures. And that's called multicultural incompetence. You walk away from that, um, either you learned nothing or it got worse. Like maybe, maybe you have a stereotype about, I don't know, people with uh, autism and you meet somebody with autism and you you come away from that thinking oh I knew it people with autism are all like such and such but you think it even more now your stereotypes were strengthened you missed an opportunity there in that uh, in that interaction to see the diversity that exists within the category and to see the background and, and whether where the behaviors come from and seem like that so multicultural incompetence is the result of an encounter where you don't get a richer understanding or a fuller understanding of the cultural background and the individual characteristics of a person and this can lead to cultural disregard or cultural disrespect. <coughs> now, it's a basic principle of cross-cultural uh, counseling and cross-cultural theory, multicultural theory, that all cultures are deserving of respect. Now, I say it's a basic principle, but many people in the field would say there are some cultures that are not deserving of respect. 
And so that's another interesting conversation. And we're talking about cultures like, let's say there's a culture of, you know, frat boys who try to take advantage of women and basically rape them. And this has happened before in the history of the United States, right? I personally would say that culture itself deserves no respect. However, on a certain level, I, I guess I would have some respect. I would say I don't value anything about that aspect of this culture, but I am interested in finding out where it came from and how people got into this pattern of behavior so we can stop it, right, so, so I can change it. So I suppose I would respect the fact that it is a culture, but um, most of the time what we mean is if you have a culture, it happened for a reason. Cultures are patterns of adaptation that people have to their environment, their behaviors and their beliefs and their, their norms and stuff like this. Those are ways that their group of people has adapted to their environment over time, and so it's a much more useful and healthy thing to try and figure out what kinds of adaptations those are, how they've been successful, and try and understand where those come from than it is to just look and say, that's stupid, you know. I don't do things like that. So um, multicultural incompetence can lead to that sort of thing. Multicultural competence is when an encounter goes well, and it's the opposite of incompetence. When you come away with a better understanding or appreciation of somebody else's cultural background and of themselves as an individual within that cultural background, you end up with validation and respect instead of disregard and disrespect for a person's culture. Now, these encounters will happen anytime you do counseling with someone from a different culture. And remember, everyone is from a different culture, but it's really a big deal sometimes. Sometimes you're working with people who are from a very different culture. So some other con dimensions to consider, um, there are culture-bound characteristics. There are ways that people behave and people act that are tied to their culture that can't be pulled out. You can't just say, that's just a cultural thing. Like, no, cultures change people. The sociopolitical process is always involved in culture. Anytime two cultures meet each other, it's like they immediately start competing, it seems. Groups of people just kind of do this. Preventing it is extremely difficult. And so there's also a, always a sociopolitical process and history of interaction between groups of people. Power and privilege are always involved. There are multiple dimensions on which people have different kinds of power and different kinds of privilege. There are very few people who have all the privilege and all the power, and there are very few people who have no privilege and no power. Um, like, for instance, if, if you're female, there are a whole bunch of ways in which you have less privilege and less, po less power than the average male, than men on average. However, what if you're female but you're somebody's boss? and you're the boss of a man. Well, in that particular interaction, you have more power than he does. Or what if you're female, but your parents left you $10 million? Well, you have a lot more power and privilege economically than many men, than the vast majority of men. But that doesn't mean that you have all the power and privilege. You still, in interpersonal interactions, are probably going to experience a lot of prejudice and discrimination because you're female, etc. Any kind of interaction will have lots and lots of ways in which each person might have more power or privilege than the other person. And sometimes the average is pretty overwhelmingly obvious, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's important to think about how this is all working together. Social justice, it's the concept that justice should extend beyond just who killed who and who took whose property. I mean, the United States and many countries, our concepts of justice are based on very immediate, only me, only my lifetime, only my generation, only my household, or only my person. I only get justice if somebody took my property in very specific ways, or I only get justice if somebody caused me physical harm in, in very s specific ways. Social justice is the idea that justice extends a lot further than that. Um, and I'm not going to get into it here. You can probably read it, 10 million dissertations on social justice on the internet. And of course, some people have turned that into kind of like a swear word and talk, talk about people being SJWs, social justice warriors. And my thought is like, well, what else are you going to fight for? What are you fighting for? So an important thing to keep in mind, and this is something that is a difficult pill for some people to swallow from certain backgrounds. It was for me. And I think I've slowly come to realize how critically important this is. A dimension of cultural difference is the history of relations between your groups and others. The most glaringly obvious example, perhaps, constantly in the United States. What if you meet somebody? What if you're white and you meet somebody who's black? at least apparently black. I mean, identification is a very complicated issue sometimes. But let's say you meet somebody who is black, identifies as black, you're white, you identify as, as white. And then you ask that question, 
you know, why why are black people so upset? I mean, you and I, we make the same amount of money. We're in the same job. You probably get even more respect at work than I do. So what do black people have to be upset about? Um, but I think there's been a lot of discussion of this recently that has pointed this out in interesting ways. Most of the time, people wanting to forget about the history of relations between two groups, those people are from the group that has been dominant and that has been doing the oppressing, not from the people being oppressed. The people wanting to remember the Civil War tend to be the people from the South, the people who lost the Civil War. The people wanting to remember race relations are the people who are of minority race, ethnicity background, or the ones who are actually experiencing um, prejudice and discrimination, or whose family members or parents have, have experienced that. It tends to be the people who have been oppressed or who are oppressed who want to remember the history, and the people who have done the oppressing who want to forget it. It's kind of like... Uh, I don't know. I remember when I was little, I was an older brother. Every once in a while, I'd do some jackass thing to my little brother. And then, of course, I wanted to forget about that very quickly. Let's just let bygones be bygones. My little brothers weren't always on board with that, so there was a lot of revenge. But <coughs> Anyway. Cultural identity development is a key part of cross-cultural counseling. You need to understand your culture. You need to understand who you are, the cultures that you come from. There's not one culture. There's lots of cultures. And you are, you are an intersection of many different cultural forces and cultural groups. Um, and you need a sense of belonging to a cultural group, which can be difficult sometimes for a lot of reasons. Cultural identity is the percentage of your identity that's attributable to your belonging in a particular group. So if you feel like you identify strongly with being a Polish American, for instance, or if you identify strongly with being an anime fan or something like that, well, then that means that's a, that's a strong cultural identity for you. That's a large percentage of who you, who you feel like you are. Um, and it's at the core of your cultural realities and the way that you view the world. It, it has to do with what you believe the social forms, the way people speak to each other, the way people behave around each other, different social roles people take. It is involved in personality. There's recent research, okay, I'm old, recent means in the past 15, 20 years, showing that there are cross-cultural average, not huge, but average personality differences sometimes, in some cases. Um, so when we're talking about all this stuff, it can apply to anybody in your life, and I hope it does, but we're in a counseling class, so it's applying to clients and you you and your clients. So one of the things that we pay attention to in these kinds of situations is language preference because communication is culture. Culture is deeply involved in communication. If you've, if you've ever spoken another language enough to try and translate and realize just how difficult it is to translate some things from one language to another, you're not just translating the words, you're translating a lot of meaning behind the words, a lot of implications and innuendo, and you're translating the culture as well as the language, and language is culture. Uh, verbal and nonverbal communica communication go into this, as our team demonstrated so nicely with their nonverbal communication um, presentation. Communication happens in lots of ways, not just with words, and there are ways of transforming language that are specific to certain subcultures. So. The form of language that in the 90s was called Ebonics and tends to be called um, AAVE, African American Vernacular English. So it's not just random slang. Many, many people have studied this, many linguists, and they said, look, it's a valid linguistic form. It has very rule based transformations of, like, you know, standard American news English. People who speak Southern English and there's various kinds of Southern English, have very specific ways, or Appalachian English have very specific kinds of modifying that, the English language. All over the world you have subgroups of language, and those language subgroups indicate, in many cases, cultural subgroups as well. So with um, language, you have a very specific way and specific patterns of tra transforming forming meanings, something in the world, objects, actions, into symbols. And this is how statistics works. <laughs> you, you see something, you write something down on your page, you do that enough, and then if what you wrote down was numbers, then you start calculating means and standard deviations, etc. And it turns out, this isn't critical for tests or anything, that the way we learn languages as babies and, and toddlers is heavily statistical. Our brains are these amazing statistical number crunching machines that we're not even aware of. So help seeking is different from culture to culture. 
And you're probably aware of a lot of this too. Some cultures value getting help quite a lot. Some cultures value it quite a lot less. You can just pay attention to almost any culture. The value of getting help if you're male versus female. Most cultures value independence and a visible show of strength at all times, emotional and physical strength in men. Some cultures much more than others, some cultures less, but overall there tends to be a trend in that direction. And so in general, across many, many cultures, you see men less likely to seek help. So when you're doing therapy, if, especially if you're doing therapy with families, you're just going to be constantly trying to get dads to come in dads, stepdads, grandpas, brothers, you're going to be trying to get the men to come to therapy. Um, in some cultures it's easier, in some cultures it's quite difficult because there are strong cultural values. It's threatening, it's kind of terrifying, it's unmanly, it's emasculating. There are certain cultures in which it's not okay, well a lot of cultures, in which it's not okay to admit that you have certain kinds of problems. So if you're working with people from, let's say, Hispanic background, it's quite likely, and it's not the only background at all, Asian American backgrounds, I, I've heard is very similar, Pacific Islander, I've heard is similar, um, working class, blue collar backgrounds in the United States, it's very similar. I mean, it's, it's very common to have uh, people not okay because they've had all these cultural messages in their life, not okay with expressing any problems involving their emotions, their feelings, their thoughts, and so they might express them physically. So you might, if you're working with people who are not from, you know, the white suburbs in upstate New York, then you might find that, that you diagnose people as much by their physical symptoms as by their emotional symptoms. You have to be very careful with that, but people will express emotional problems as physical problems. They'll have stomach aches and headaches and fevers and things like this. So there are certain kinds of life situations in which it's okay to get help. If you're getting married, in most cultures, you're supposed to ask for help in certain ways from certain people. If you're becoming a woman, becoming a man at that kind of transition, you're supposed to ask for help in certain ways from certain people. If you're in a certain job, you can ask for help from certain coworkers, certain ways, certain bosses, certain ways. And there are certain kinds of help that you can ask for and you can't ask for. And again, in many cultures, help involving um, mental and emotional problems is not okay. I don't mean it's literally not okay. I mean, there are a lot of messages in the culture saying it's not okay. So, for instance, I heard recently about a, a very innovative program for women in the, in the UK, in Great Britain, who, I think it was in London, who came from Africa, and they had experienced horrific abuse, and they had seen their family members killed in front of them. They had been raped repeatedly, etc. and they managed to get out. A lot of them came from places like Sudan and Somalia. Um, although Somalia's coming down. This was a few years ago. But um, they wouldn't talk about it. They had these cultural values, plus they were probably massively traumatized. I mean, there's just PTSD everywhere when you have refugee populations. But um, the, the therapists who were working with them decided to stop trying to get them week after week to just come in and talk because, you know, they were, they were mandated by the government. You have to go to therapy because we've determined that you are a refugee, et cetera. And so the British government is like, we're paying for your therapy, so you need to go if you want to work towards citizenship and things like this. Well, the therapists finally got tired of trying to make them talk because it wasn't working. So they just started having cooking classes and they just said, everybody show us your best cooking, your, your best food. And, and after a couple of weeks of that, then the women started talking. And they wanted to know what the therapist's favorite foods were and they would cook and cook and cook and talk a little bit. I mean, that was an okay way to get help. Talking a little bit about your life while you're cooking. Uh, and it will vary from culture to culture. So there are subgroups and roles who gets help. Um, women get certain kind of help much more than men. Men get certain kind of help more than women, but it tends not to be psychological counseling. Adults versus children. It's okay for children to receive help, but adults are less likely in many cultures. Younger versus older people, there are differences there as well. Seeking help can threaten your social status and your view of yourself. Certain social classes, certain roles. It's very popular if you're somewhat wealthy to constantly be in therapy. It turns out it's a lot less popular if you're like, uh, you know, a plumber from Milwaukee to be in therapy. You don't usually boast to your friends about casually seeing a therapist this week. I mean, and this has a lot to do with social classes and historical backgrounds and things. So there are a lot of different things that get involved in the format, in the way we help each other, each other that vary from culture to culture and should vary from culture to culture. So who comes to therapy? In some cultures, I mean, we... We are stuck with individuals, right? Because we learned from Freud. 
that was both a plus and a minus that Freud got everybody thinking about one person with another person sitting down and talking. Of course, with him, it was mostly the client talking. But a lot of therapists and theories followed that format, but it doesn't work very well for some cultures. Some cultures, work, it works much better to bring in a family. Other cultures, it works better to bring in parents. Even if the parents are elderly and the people they're talking about, the clients are like in their 50s. Right? So sometimes it works better to bring in the parents and have the parents talk about the kids. I mean, there's all these different variations and understanding that there can be variations and looking for those and learning what they are can be important. Do families come? Does your spouse come? Do your children come? Sometimes it's important to involve religious leaders or teachers. Sometimes employers are very important in certain cultures. And friends can be important. Now, in our individualistic we're not the most individualistic, but we're pretty individualist on average in the United States. We tend to think you, you and the therapist, but that's a bit of a bias. It, it kind of blinds us to other possibilities sometimes. So yeah, sometimes that's the best choice, but sometimes it's not going to work with certain cultures, and maybe it's not even the most effective. So who is involved outside the session? Teachers, friends, probation officers. These are the people I've worked in the past. So. Back to this idea of historical group relations, you need to pay attention to what's been going on. How has your group related to other groups? And believe me, I mean, I'm learning this every year for like the last 30 years of my life when I finally, you know, 30 years ago, I kind of woke up to the idea that uh, the world wasn't exactly what I was hearing on, on Reagan National Radio. Um, people from minority groups, people who have been oppressed, are aware of the history of relations between your group and theirs. Now, I have this thing that I do, and I'm trying to not do it, but it's just so fascinating. I'm really interested in people's names, and I've had to learn how to ask very carefully. I'm j it's just a linguistic thing. I'm like, that is so cool. Where did that one come from? That's awesome. Um, but I have to be very careful, because asking what someone's name is and where their name came from can be a little passive-aggressive bastard way of putting them in their place and reminding them that they are from a less powerful social group. So where's that name from? Where are you from? No, I mean, really, where are you from? You and your brown skin and your accent. I mean, it can take on that flavor. And so I've had to learn not to ask that a lot of times, no matter how curious I am, because people are very aware of what social group I'm from, what social group they're from, in many cases, when I ask them about their name. And for them, they're wondering, is this another one of those asshole moves that your social group has done to my social group a million times in the past? So I try and avoid that sometimes now. Okay, not all the time. I should. So power differentials. Um, very rarely do cultures just exist in equal power next to each other. Almost always one has more political, social, and economic power than the other. It's almost never balanced. There's social, cultural power, pa um, power, political power, economic power. Now, if you came from the less dominant group, I probably don't have to tell you this as much. If you came from the more dominant group, if you're white, if you're male, if you're middle class, <coughs> if you're straight, if you're cis, in certain situations, then that's when you need the awareness because the people you're talking to about certain issues in certain situations, they are aware. They are aware how straight people have treated gay people. They are aware how white people have treated non-white people, etc. And so you in the dominant group might be the one that needs to pay the most attention. So, for instance, how do you feel about government authority? People around, people around whom I grew up. Uh, I knew a lot of people with large underground bunkers full of weapons and owned a lot of camo and had some possibly not totally legal military surplus uh, munitions, explosives, things like that. <laughs> I grew up around a lot of right-wing militia groups when I was a kid. It was pretty normal. It was like, ah, that's not me. That creeps me out. But three of my friends, man, they go out and shoot M16s with their buddies. And they're 12, you know. That's normal. Um, how safe do you feel in your community? How do you feel when you walk down a street? When you see a police officer, do you think, oh, all right, there's a cop here, I feel better, or do you think, oh shit, there's a cop here? Um, how important to you is collective decision making? Are you like, I am one lone woman or man against the world and none can stand in my path for I know my mind, or are you more like, I don't think I should make that decision before I check with my aunts and uncles and some people down the block? I mean, these things vary between groups. How important is the bottom line? 
Are you like a let's get things done? I don't care about your personal problems. The point is, you got a project, you do the project. The end. You want to keep your job, you do the project. What's interesting is um, people who are most concerned about the bottom line tend to almost always be from uh, dominant cultural groups. Weirdly, if you flip the cultural groups in si situational ways, at least in some research, then suddenly whoever gets becomes dominant cares about the bottom line. There was research in the 90s where men and women did this, like, you know, pretend business organization thing for a couple of days, and the researchers found that the men were more like, I don't care about your emotions, I care about whether things get done. And the women were like, hey, we need to build coalitions, we need to pay attention to the feelings and emotions and identities of all the people in the group, or else it's not valid. Well, then the researchers flipped everything and gave all the women the power and everything more or less reversed. The men suddenly cared a whole lot about community and people's feelings and being concerned about who's being overlooked and marginalized. And, and then the women were like, I don't care about your marginalized feelings. Listen, boys, you get it done or you don't get paid. So it's, uh, group politics are very often about power. So how important is it to go through the proper channels? Um, I saw a discussion once where somebody was saying, you know, these, these Native Americans up just north of the border, kind of up in Quebec, who had a semi-violent uprising 10 years ago or so, they should have just gone through proper channels. And then somebody else said, I want you to think really hard about what you said. Think back through the last 300 years. How has it gone when Native Americans have worked through the proper channels? How has that worked out for them? In some groups, working through the proper channels just means that's a different way to get oppressed and abused. In other groups, the proper channels are the way you get justice, and so there are very different things. How do you react when a family member has a conflict? None of my business, got to get involved, oh my gosh, the sky's falling. So sometimes when you have people from different groups working together in client therapist situations, especially when the therapist is from a dominant social group historically, like say the therapist is, let's say, white, and the client is non-white, let's say you have an Asian American client, and uh, a very, I'm from the Midwest, and my parents emigrated here from England in the 1600s kind of therapist, right? The best of intentions, but there's a bad history of diagnosing non-dominant social group clients, gay clients, non-white clients, Jewish clients, etc with resistance, therapeutic resistance. Now this is a Freudian term, it comes from the idea that your unconscious is fighting back or something, but it's been used in pretty much any kind of therapy to mean the client's just basically not cooperating. The client's, I'm having a hard time doing therapy with this person. Well, this says ahem, because resistance sometimes is a stand-in for I can't be bothered to figure out what's going on with my client, especially socially, culturally, historically, or having to do with power relations. So it can lead to both clients and therapists denying problems. It can lead to an adversarial view, so view of counseling. As soon as counseling feels adversarial, I don't know, it's almost all over sometimes. It's hard to pull it out of that rut. I mean, it's like in a nosedive. Those are two different metaphors. Anyway, you're in a rut, and the rut is no diving, and your rut is going to crash into the ground like a nosediving plane. Um, it can lead to distrust of the counselor and the therapeutic process, which sometimes could be a very rational thing in those situations. And that can lead to just therapeutic silence, clients not wanting to talk to the therapist because they don't trust what the therapist is going to do with their disclosures, with their intimate information. Passive-aggressive behaviors towards the therapist and by the therapist as well. It can lead to premature termination. It can lead, and that is bad. Premature termination is almost always bad because it means that a client had a terrible experience with psychotherapy. And sometimes that means a th psychotherapist made a lot of bad choices. Not always, but sometimes. And so now psychotherapy has a worse reputation in the world and fewer people come to get help. So what do we do about all this stuff? There's no perfect answers, but cross-cultural competency is a big part of it. So um, one view from cross-cultural counseling is that client and therapist culture have to always be exactly the same. You cannot counsel a black person unless you're black. You cannot counsel a Latter-day Saint unless you're Latter-day Saint. You cannot counsel an Appalachian person unless you're Appalachian. So that's one view. And it has been advocated by several people. There are a lot of problems with that, including the fact that by definition, just by the numbers and the base rates here, 
the people who need the most counseling tend to be the people experiencing the most stress. Those tend to be the people from the less dominant groups. Gay people experience more stress on average than straight people. Trans people experience more, more stress on average than cis people. You know, uh, minorities experience more stress on average than people from the dominant culture group. And so there are more mental health problems and counseling needs in the non-dominant groups. And yet because of all the, the historical dynamics that lead up to this level of stress, this kind of oppression that's going on, then you also have far fewer people from those groups represented among therapists. You don't have enough black therapists. You don't have enough gay therapists. You don't have enough trans therapists. You don't have enough Appalachian therapists. It, it's just a catch-22. No, that's not the wrong thing. It's just a perverse cycle. It's not a catch-22. I'd use that. That was totally the wrong thing. Um, so requiring that the client and the therapist culture be the same means a whole lot of people who need therapy are never going to get it. So most people recognize that some people think that that's ideal, but even they tend to say, but it's not practical. So, <laughs> and then there's problems like how same is same? Do you have to be exactly the same in your culture? Okay. So a much more common view is you work towards cultural sensitivity. You try and get similar, you, might, you try most of the time to match people up with, with um, clients and, and, and therapists. And so you end up with weird stuff, like if you're in a little tiny uh, therapy center, a little clinic that only has like six therapists and it's in the middle of you know, rural Indiana where I did my internship and you have exactly one non-white therapist there, a social worker who's a Pacific Islander, um, American, he's, he gets everybody who's non-white because he's the only therapist who's not white. And, that starts to seem really terrible and stereotyping and annoying after a while, and sometimes the clients really appreciate it, and sometimes they don't. I mean, so you try and match as much as possible most of the time, if if there's no problems with that. But you can't most of the time. You need cultural sensitivity. This whole thing we talked about at the beginning of this lecture, you need cultural awareness um, yourself and work towards multicultural competence with the groups you're working with. You need your personal awareness, your cultural education, all the stuff we talked about at the beginning, and then eventually working up towards culturally specific counseling techniques once you've got that other stuff under your belt. And that tends to be, uh, so far it's working out to be a pretty good approach. There's no perfect answer here. I mean, it's a terrible situation currently. So I'm going to switch back over here where I'm like really huge. All right, I wore a Viking hat, and I could claim that it has something to do with culture of something or other, but it doesn't. It's just I wanted to wear a hat because I figured you'd like to look at something more exciting than just my big, huge, beardy face. So I wore a hat that I found in my daughter's room. I really like it. It's a little small on me. It's kind of squeezing my head, but it does make me feel fierce. And I always joke that I'm built like a Viking, but... I don't think I'm descended from Vikings. Although, I don't know, the Vikings have a lot of kids all over Europe. I'm descended from people from England, Germany, and Scotland, so... Mostly Germany and England. I don't even get to be like, I could wear a kilt, because the Scottish thing, kind of iffy. I'm not sure my mom's right about that.